Welcome to the Prehistoric Society's 19th Sarah Champion Memorial Lecture. Uh, my name is Dr Rachel Quellen and it is my absolute honour to be delivering the lecture to you today. The title of my lecture is Becoming Metallic, the Emergence of Metals in Britain and Ireland. Hello there. It is my absolute pleasure to have been uh, selected to deliver the Sarah Champion Lecture. And I know that uh, Professor Gamble has uh, shared with uh, Sarah's family that this is how the lecture is going to be delivered this year. I couldn't have imagined 12 months ago when I sat in the Society of Antiquaries and listened to Matt Knight's fabulous talk on fragmenting bronzes that this would be how the next Sarah Champion would be delivered. So much has changed in the last 12 months. But in some ways this could be advantageous for the prehistoric society and for the lecture. Our hope is that it is possible to reach a much bigger audience than in the average year by putting the talk up on the YouTube channel. And as a nice tie into my talk itself, as we test this new technology for delivering these talks to you, um, I'm, going to self, I'm going to talk about how it is that we adapt and understand and come to change new technologies. My talk draws on my interest in the study of change and my recently published book, Change in Archaeology. Specifically, I'm going to talk about the case study chapter from that book that focuses on how we can understand the changes that occurred as the Bronze Age emerged in Britain and Ireland. Books are many things. And one of the things that my book is most squarely is an archaeological theory book. In this talk, though, I'm going to focus not on the theory, but instead on the case study. For those of you who share my passion for archaeological theory, I'm sure you'll see the undercurrents, language and influence of the theory on my arguments. For those of you who don't share my joy in archaeological theory, hopefully you instead can enjoy the narrative of the Bronze Age built around the flat axe that I'm going to share with you. My talk has three key parts. First, I'm going to provide some background and contextualization of the early Bronze Age flat axe, the main subject of my work. From there, I'm going to move on to explore the properties of early metals in Britain and Ireland. And the end of the talk, drawing on my work using metalwork wear analysis and the primary analysis of a large sample of axes, I'm going to present a changing history of the early Bronze Age flat axe. Debate about the start of the Bronze Age has been a hot topic for a number of years now. The Prehistoric Society's book, Is There a British Chalcolithic, is an excellent example of this. Much of the debate centres around the role, or otherwise, that migration played in the emergence of the early Bronze Age. There has been a pendulum swing in interpretation, from early accounts where migration and invasion were the driving force for change, over to debates which emphasise the adoption of practices without the necessary movement of people, back to stories of small scale migration, and more recently, a continued swing towards arguments for large scale migration. In the most recent contributions to this debate, we've seen an emphasis on human remains as the key category of evidence to help us understand this transition. Isotopic work from the Beaker People Project, again, published by the Prehistoric Society, as well as ADNA analysis by Olalde et al, have been used to think about how much movement there was in the period and at what scale, and how this might have contributed to the emergence of the Bronze Age and the Beaker People. In order to tell my narrative of the early Bronze Age in Britain and Ireland, I avoid focusing on ADNA, isotopes and migrants, and instead focus on telling the histories of materials, placing copper and bronze at the centre of my work. I choose to do so because I am a metalwork wear analyst. I know, however, that I leave myself open to the criticism for doing so. Cleland Pollard and Robertson Freeman have written specifically about the risk of privileging metal over all other evidence when considering the start of the Bronze Age. As Robertson Freeman states, quote, archaeologists studying this period tend to treat metal in isolation as either the most or the least important material, end quote. For me, focusing on metal is part of my attempt to strike at the heart of the problem, to show how metallurgy was actually connected to other technologies, how it was made to fit within pre-existing assemblages and practices, and it was not the singular cause of change at the start of the Bronze Age.
In my work, metal doesn't sit apart from other materials and technologies. Rather, I aim to show how it connects to other materials, components, processes. I think of metal as one strand within a messy 3D knot that flows through time. I pull on the metal thread and thereby shake and shift other threads and knots. I map the metal thread and it leads me to other parts of the assemblage. What follows draws extensively on research funded by the Leverhulme Trust as part of an early career fellowship at the University of Leicester. The project involved the study of 259 copper and bronze flat axes from across Britain and Ireland and focused on using axes to understand change at the beginning of the Bronze Age. Early Bronze Age flat axes and blades, first made of copper and later bronze, were probably the forms in which most communities first encountered metal. The emphasis on axes in my own work is because their thicker form and deposition away from grave contexts means they're often much better preserved than metal blades like knives or daggers, making them more suitable for analysis. Though we have just started a project at Leicester which is analysing knives and daggers for wear analysis marks. My understanding of axes draws extensively on metalwork wear analysis, which allows me a window into understanding how metal objects were produced and used. I use the term use in the broadest possible sense to include not only practical uses, but also depositional practices and symbolic aspects. In my work, I treat metal not as a fixed material with clearly defined properties that we know today from material science, but instead, I aim to uncover what properties, potentials and uses metals had during the Bronze Age and how these changed. I work from the starting point that copper and later bronze can only be understood in relation to the earlier practices that effectively prefigured them. And one of the main things I th think about in relation to this is stone axe technology. The early Bronze Age flat axe as a form dates to between circa 2005 and 1700 Cal BC. Typologically, over this period, there were a number of changes in form, from thick, square, broad-butted copper flat axes through to thinner, narrower-butted bronze axes with more flaring blades. These axes have been typologised by Peter Harbison in Ireland, Stuart Needham in Southern Britain, and Peter Schmidt and Colin Burgess in Northern Britain and Scotland. For the sake of chronological comparison, I adopt Needham's metalwork assemblages as an overall chronological scheme into which the changes in axe typology can be fitted. These assemblages are based on associations between groups of metal objects found together in hordes and as such are suggested to be the product of not only temporal change, but also changes in production and depositional practices. In Needham's own illustration of this, the different assemblages overlap at the start and end, blurring into each other. Two key points arise. Firstly, the change in typology indicates to us constant change through the period. Second, copper at 2500 Cal BC and later bronze at 2200 Cal BC are not the same materials that they were by 1700 Cal BC. The properties, qualities and potentials of these materials change through that period. Whilst we call everything in this sequence a flat axe, what a flat axe did, how it was understood and what it meant changed between 2500 and 1700 Cal BC. My aim in this paper is to show you some of that change. The largest distribution of early copper flat axes comes from Ireland. They have broad square butts and relatively straight sides. The discovery of the Ross Island mines in the southwest of Ireland by William O'Brien is key to our understanding of early metalwork and metalworking in Ireland and Britain. At the site of Ross Island, O'Brien found evidence of copper extraction and working associated with beaker pottery and potential hut structures. The discovery that the ores which were extracted from Rock, Ross Island shared the same chemical signature as the earliest copper and bronze objects known in Ireland and in much of Britain, around 70% of the earliest metal is tied to this mining site brings this mining site into the narrative of the emergence of the period, 
O'Brien has convincingly argued that mining and metallurgy were not independent inventions in Ireland, but that the technology to carry out both activities emerged from the migration of skilled miners and metallurgists from Europe, and most likely from Atlantic France and Iberia. Whilst the technology appears to have continental origins, inst interestingly, the adoption of copper and later bronze metalwork in Ireland takes a clearly insular form. William Schneel points out how the adopting of a foreign technology does not mean the adopting of the logic associated with that technology in its original setting. Introduced technologies are not merely adopted, they're also adapted. They, they're made to fit within existing value systems and relations. The effect of a new material in, say, Ireland is not the same as the effect it will have in another place, say, Iberia or even Scotland. Neither is it the case that new technologies exist separate from pre-existing ones. Rather, new technologies have to fit within pre-existing assemblages. Joanna Sophia and Mary Louise Stig Sorensen highlight how new objects and technologies involve the renegotiation of and changes to existing social relations, rights and responsibilities. Metal as a new component had to fit within existing practices and technologies whilst also disrupting them. David Kingery argues that Kuhnian models of revolutionary change where new, therefore better technologies completely replace older ones causing a paradigm shift, often exist surrounding the adoption of new technology. In the case of metalwork, this has certainly been one of the main models. The start of the Bronze Age is presumed to mark a significant shift where stone technology is presumed to fall out of favour. Axes as tools and as a form were not novel. Polished stone axes and flint axes have a wide distribution across Britain and Ireland throughout the Neolithic and were clearly both functionally and symbolically important. It's not an accident that the form in which we first see metal truly proliferate in Britain and Ireland is that of the axe. In order to understand the new technology of metalworking in relation to axes, we have to consider stone and metal together. There is a more extended argument about this consideration of stone and metal together in the chapter of my book that I mention. I'm not just saying that to plug it and get you to buy a copy, just because uh, you'll get more of what I mean in what's written there. The theoretical approach that I take argues that the properties of a given material are not intrinsic to them, but a result of the wider relational contexts they exist within. Today, copper conducts electricity in assemblages with wires, power stations and electricity. Such assemblages did not exist in the early Bronze Age. Peter Bray has explored the concept of metalaity as, quote, the collective properties and potentials that come with metal. Bray's ideas about metalaity and my own drawing on the new materialism alloy well together to construct the kind of approach that I take. Bray argues that the specific properties and potentials that a metal has aren't universal, but a product of context. Different communities have different understandings of the properties and qualities of metals. In this part of the paper, I explore what properties metals, specifically really copper and bronze here, had in the early Bronze Age in Britain and Ireland, and how these changed over that period. The work draws extensively on metalwork wear analysis, but also on published work looking at things like chemical composition, particularly the work of Peter Bray in the Oxford lab. We know that early Bronze Age metallurgy in Britain and Ireland relied on smelting, rather than, as in the old copper culture of the Americas, cold working copper ore. It's clear, therefore, that one of the earliest properties associated with copper at least for those who worked it, was that it could be made into a molten liquid. Metalwork wear analysis reveals that even the earliest copper flat axes show signs of polishing and grinding. This indicates that copper and later bronze objects should have smooth edges and a clear and often symmetrical form. The evidence for grinding and polishing also links to earlier practices surrounding polished stone axes and is indicative of a desire to bring out the colour and shine of the material. Bray argues that a number of the properties of copper were unknown during the period 2005 to 2200 BC. 
In particular, he argues that copper's ability to respond to heat and hammering as part of the finishing processes for making an axe was only slowly understood. Hammering is a key process in the hardening of copper and bronze. When hammered, the crystals within metals become more clearly aligned as a result, and as a result, the material becomes harder and stronger. However, when we continue to hammer, we begin to make the metal brittle and more likely to fracture. Heating a hammered metal, the process of annealing, allows a reduction in this brittleness. Hammering was a deeply peculiar technique in an early Bronze Age British or Irish context. There are no other materials one makes harder by hitting them. That said, the bodily technique of hammering, knowing when, where and how hard to strike, may well have had links to percuss the percussive use of hammers in flint napping for reduction. Heating materials to make them harder was however well known in this period, from the firing techniques of clay to fire hardening wooden posts and tools to make them more durable. The earliest Irish copper flat axes show no evidence of hammering. However, in Irish copper flat axes from Metalwork Assemblage 2 onwards, there's evidence of, quote, a, regularly, a relatively regular approach to both hammering and heating. That quote comes from Bray. This is further supported by my own work. Effective hammering can be very hard to recognise through metalwork wear analysis. When the person who made the axe is really good at hammering, it's barely visible. But there are early examples where unskilled hammering is evident. And that's what you can see on the screen now. You can see the peculiarly shaped hammer blows and the way in which it's caused the corner of the axe to fracture and to stretch out in funny ways. However, from, MA, from Metalwork Assemblage 3 onwards, hammering becomes quite hard for us to identify unless it's being used as a decorative technique. Bray suggests this shift in processes indicates a shift in how the material was understood. In Metalwork Assemblage 1 in Ireland, the specifically metallic properties of copper were not really understood. It was probably thought of more like a rock. Whereas in Metalwork Assemblage 2, new properties emerged. The situation is a little different in Britain, where Bray argues that communities didn't begin to understand the properties and potentials of metal to be hardened through hammering and annealing until post 2200 BC. Exploring hammering as a property shows that what metal was, as a material, was changing in this period. This change was also regional and patchy. It was part of localised practices that metals existed within. And when we look at the axes from across Britain and Ireland from these periods, we see very different hammering patterns until we reach a point where hammering disappears as a technique that can be observed via metalwork analysis, metalwork wear analysis, because people are so skilled at it. The addition of tin to bronze acts to produce a harder material and as a result bronze tools can be used for longer periods before they need to be reshaped or reworked in comparison to copper tools. Comparative experimental work with bronze and stone axes suggests bronze axes were more efficient, though this may have been more of a product of their shape as much as their hardness. In the Bronze Age, where scientific hardness testing was not an option, Communities learned that tin bronze axes not only had a different colour, but also a different temporality. Bronze was a material that lasted longer. It needed reworking less. The literature currently suggests a relatively rapid shift from copper use in metalwork assemblages 1 and 2 through to the use of tin bronze in metalwork assemblage 3. This rapid shift seems unusual when we consider the gradual development of processes like hammering. Bray has argued that there may actually have been a more gradual lead in to the transition to bronze via the production of early tin bronzes in Cornwall, which were later preferentially recycled, effectively obscuring them from archaeological view. One of the key properties of metal today is that we can recycle it. Recycling metal is often cited as a specifically recycling itself, sorry, is often cited as a specifically Bronze Age innovation. In the case of metal, the melting down of older, existing or broken metal objects to make more molten copper or copper alloy for new objects actually has links to pre-existing practices. The sharpening and resharpening of lithics was common in the Neolithic and was effectively a form of re-enlivening a blunt tool to make it new again. 
Kevin Freeman has argued that objects such as flint daggers may well have been recycled and reused as spearheads or striker lights. Similarly, we know that older pots and burnt flint were sometimes used as a form of temper in new vessels. Reusing an object by resharpening it or repurposing the form was not new. Returning an object to a molten form and thereby completely erasing its earlier shape was, however, innovative. We think of recycling today as a relatively anonymous process where we don't know what our can or our plastic bottle will become. And there's no reason to assume this was the case in the early Bronze Age, where specific objects could have been brought together to create new objects. Considering, be considering burial assemblages, Joe Brooke has argued that there were specifically gathered collections of objects brought together by mourners, indicating the relations the dead existed within. She goes on to argue that this was indicative of a relational and composite model of personhood in the Bronze Age. In the specific case of necklaces and beads found in early Bronze Age burials, roughly contemporary with the development and increase in recycling of metals, Anne Woodward has argued that there were collections of beads from different sources with different histories which were being brought together to create a composite whole and then perhaps redistributed at the graveside. As recycling developed, it was perhaps thought of in the same way, a bringing together of a composite of objects with different histories in order to make something new. One could imagine communities building connections in this way as they recombined and combined axes and blades to make new ones, perhaps linked to specific stages in the life cycle. Recycling is not just about reusing what is perhaps broken or tired, but also about reshaping things into new forms. Pollard et al. argue that, quote, recycling was not dictated only by necessity, but was equally directed towards modifying the shape of an axe to make it more acceptable as it was passed from hand to hand by infusing local ownership and values into the metal. Early recycling in Britain and Ireland was, given the flow of copper, probably often about the reshaping of axes and blades into locally appropriate forms. Axes were being reshaped through recycling processes to make them fit within local practices and customs. Their previous form was effectively erased, though perhaps not forgotten, and a new local form emerged. The lack of proper ingots in the British and Irish Bronze Age isn't because we haven't found them, Rather, it's because one community's axe, when traded with a neighbour, effectively acted as an ingot. As we move through the Early Bronze Age, recycling increases. By around 2200 BC, people have begun to appreciate the potential for recycling. Chemical analysis from Peter Bray suggests about 10% of Metalwork Assemblage 3 axes were recycled, 30% of Metalwork Assemblage 4-5, and 40% of Metalwork Assemblage 6. By 1800 to 1600 Cal BC, there were metal objects in circulation that were made of Ross Island metal, which was first smelted around 500 years earlier and had been remelted and recycled multiple times. Like the necklaces discussed above, these objects can be thought of as composite heirlooms. Bray also suggests that early recycling might have been used as a way to increase the amount of tin within an alloy. Recycling could therefore have been associated with changing the specific properties of a metal, taking a softer metal and by recycling it, making it a more local shape and making it harder. The shift towards recycling is the build-up of a series of changes across a range of assemblages and technologies, bringing together processes of reuse, recombination, fragmentation, and the practice of including older and different materials within composite collections. It's a significant shift in the understanding of materials, but this is gradual, something that happens over centuries and brings with it pre-existing understandings of materials. At the same time as these changes in recycling practice occurred, there were also changes in the treatment of the dead. There was a broad trend over the course of the early Bronze Age for a shift from inhumation to cremation, though this was not a unilinear progress. Instead, clear choices about the preference for inhumation or cremation were being made by mourners. This was also a highly regionalised process where different communities made different decisions, reflecting local choices and practices in parallel to what we see with the adaption of metalworking 
Jo Brooke has highlighted the connections between cremation and metalworking in her work. Cremation involves fire as the catalyst for a transformative and spectacular process that is both controllable and uncontrollable. Similarly, the process of smelting involves fire as the catalyst for transformation. Combining multiple strands of evidence, we can suggest that communities were recasting bronze into locally appropriate forms, which indicates a spread of metalworking knowledge through Britain and Ireland. Bray's work illustrates an increased understanding of the ability to remelt re metal from 2200 BC and higher levels of recycling from then onwards. These shifts coincide with the changes in burial practices as communities came to adopt cremation. The practices of metalworking and cremation overlap. They share components and processes in common. Evidence for both smelting sites and pyre sites is rare in Britain and Ireland. Now, this may be a product of their ephemeral nature and poor archaeological recognition, but it might also be indicating to us how materials related to fiery transformations were understood and treated. Following cremation, the bones of the deceased were picked out from the charred remains of the pyre. There may be a link here to how the remains of the smelt would have been picked through to discover the prills of copper within. I'm not arguing that cremation is the cause of recycling or vice versa, but that we should think about these two processes as entangled and connected, affecting the development of each other. In the final part of this talk, I turn my attention to the axes themselves and draw upon my own primary data from wear analysis. I take the single category, early Bronze Age flat axe, and work to map how what a flat, flat axe was and what it did changed between 2500 and 1700 Cal BC. The earliest flat axes, dating to metalwork assemblages one and two, are often the most badly corroded because they're made of copper rather than bronze, meaning they're often harder to interpret through metalwork wear analysis. Despite these corrosion issues, metalwork assemblage one and two axes show clear signs of use. There are four key strands of evidence to interpret here. Axe blades are often very worn and blunted, sometimes showing signs of fracture from use. They're also frequently very asymmetrically worn. There are frequent signs of striations indicative of use in woodworking. And there are also some marks on metalwork assemblage one axes that are hard to parallel in the experimental work I've done. This evidence is complex to interpret. Copper is softer than bronze and therefore it wears more easily. And the problems of interpretation here are further compounded by the limited use of hammering to harden metalwork assemblage one and two axes. So we have to weigh up whether what we're seeing on the surface of these axes dating to between 2005 and 2200 BC is very heavy use or a product of the relative softness of copper axes. Bringing the four lines of evidence together gives us the strongest interpretation. The data indicates that these axes were being used for woodworking. And the marks that we can't parallel in experiments suggest that some of these axes were being used in ways which we might not expect and have not recreated experimentally to date. I interpret this as indicating very flexible use of the earliest copper flat axes. Communities were using axes in innovative and varied ways as the rules and traditions that defined what this kind of axe were for were being shaped. I want to suggest that communities first tried to use them in similar ways to stone axes and as they learned of their properties, uh, began to experiment with other uses. The proportion of blunt and asymmetrical axes is indicative of heavy use, but also of the understanding communities had of these materials. It's possible to take an asymmetrically worn axe and reorient it in the haft to make it wear more symmetrically. This doesn't seem to have happened very often at all with the earliest flat axes. It's also possible to rework such an axe to give it a fresher and more symmetrical blade. Again, this doesn't seem to have happened with the earliest flat axes. Read alongside Bray's chemical analysis, this confirms that the understanding of how metal blades could be worked, reworked and recycling was developing rather than established at this time.
Axes from metalwork assemblage one and two are most frequently recovered as single finds. Deposition in hordes was less common. Metal axes weren't deposited often in burials or settlement sites either. Many of the axes that were deposited were highly worn with asymmetrical blades that could have been reworked and recycled, but were not. Instead, they were deposited in a worn state, returning an axe that may have been interpreted at the time as no longer usable to the ground. From 2200 BC, there were changes in what an axe was and what an axe did. As discussed above, the most significant aspect was the shift from the use of copper to bronze. In concert with this, there were changes in the working process. Hammering to harden and work bronze became the norm. Blunt blades were being reworked and resharpened, and a wider range of regional forms of axe developed, indicating recycling was occurring into locally appropriate forms. Taken together, we can see that the properties of metal shifted. It was becoming associated with an ability to transform and rework. It was being treated less like stone. This was a material that could be shaped and reworked multiple times, where the application of heat was a key transformative process, where hammering and sharpening could change, refresh and enliven a blade multiple times. And these changes happened alongside the emergence of a range of regional pottery forms and cremation as a key for funerary practice. The regionalisation of practices at this time is particularly evident in the Migdale Marnock metalworking tradition of North East Scotland dating to metalwork assemblage three. The most common flat axe form in Ireland at this date was the Killeher axe. However, in Scotland and Northern Britain, it was the Migdale axe. Migdale axes were produced using copper from Ross Island, presumed to have been combined with tin from southwest England. Most of the raw materials probably made their way to Scotland in the form of Killeher axes. The spe specifically Scottish form of axe is indicative of a specifically Scottish form of metalworking. Migdale Marnock metalworking was the localisation of Irish metalworking practices into communities where they were altered and adjusted, causing different properties to materialise, and as a result, what emerged was specifically local. Migdale axes are thought to have been cast in one part moulds, primarily made from hard rocks such as sandstone and probably capped with a flat stone during casting. This provides somewhat of a conundrum in my analysis. Around half of the earlier flat axes from metalwork assemblage one and two, that's about 28 of 54 axes, appear to have been cast in a one part mould. But the rest show evidence of either surface sym symmetry or casting seams indicative of casting in a two part mould. On that basis, I suggest that the use of two part moulds was developing during the time of metalwork assemblages one and two, probably in Ireland. In Metalwork Assemblage 3, when the Migdale axes emerged, there are only five axes in my sample showing unequivocal evidence of casting in a one-part mould, though there are eight additional Migdale axes where I cannot identify the type of mould they were cast in confidently. The evidence from the moulds themselves seems to indicate one-part mould casting was the norm in the Migdale Marnock tradition demonstrating a probable difference in metalworking practices between Ireland and Scotland. However, the surfaces of the axes themselves somewhat confuse this story. There are some that have been cast in one part moulds, but there are also others where either their surfaces were post cast worked to such a degree as to disguise their casting in a one part mould, or they were cast in two part moulds. What appears here as a problem in my data that bugged me for quite a long time is probably actually indicative of shifting and changing practices over time and potentially also of the continued relations between Scottish and Irish metal workers. Rather than expecting all of my data to agree, showing, for example, that all Migdale axes were cast in one part moulds, it seems that some axes were being cast in one part moulds, some were perhaps cast in one part moulds and then worked to make them appear symmetrical and others were being cast in two-part moulds, showing that the Migdale tradition wasn't homogenous or static. <laughs>
Another peculiarity of the Migdale tradition is the practice of tin coating. Some Migdale axes have a surface covering of tin and a bronze interior. Needham associates this practice with some of the earliest tin bronze axes produced in Scotland and interprets the use of tin as a conspicuous practice. Tin coated axes look different, they have a greyer colour and that's what you can see in the photo on the screen now. Unfortunately that greyness reflects the light dreadfully and this picture isn't what I would describe as perfect by any stretch. Needham has argued that access to tin might have been limited, making it a precious material. And when metal workers chose to coat their axes in tin, they were thereby demonstrating their access to the metal. Needham's interpretation of the Migdale Monarch tradition sees it as a local form of metalworking, which I agree with. But he argues that the aim of metal workers was to maximise their prestige through this tin coating practice. I want to suggest there are some other ways we could think about this practice. Focusing on the metals themselves allows us to tell a different story. Bronze and copper have different properties because of the addition of tin or absence of tin in the case of copper. One of those different properties is that bronze is harder than copper. As communities came to understand that this new material bronze had been made stronger through combining copper with another material, perhaps this understanding led to the decision to coat some axes in tin to exploit this association between tin and hardness. The Migdale Monarch tradition is a really interesting one. It demonstrates that metalworking didn't develop in a unilinear way in Britain and Ireland. The use of what in technological terms would be described as simpler moulds indicates change wasn't linear or progressive. Furthermore, the development not only of the local form of the Migdale axe, but also the tin coating technique, shows how metals were adapted locally to fit within their local practices, but also how a new component can cause unpredictable changes and doesn't have the same effect everywhere. Axes in Ireland and axes in Scotland at this point in time were very different things. Axes belonging to Metalwork Assemblage 3 from across Britain and Ireland show clear evidence of having been used for woodworking. Drawing a broad comparison between them and the earlier copper axes, many of the Metalwork Assemblage 3 axes appear less worn, they're less asymmetrical, and there are far fewer unusual marks that we can't parallel in experiments. I interpret this data to show that not only was bronze a more hard wearing material, but also communities were coming, becoming better at working, maintaining and reworking their axes and manipulating them within their hafts in order to extend their use life. This was also likely connected to more controlled, less flexible use of bronze axes. Whereas earlier axes were often deposited very worn, though they of course had the potential to be reworked or recycled, but were not, Axes deposited during Metalwork Assemblage 3 were often still functional. This is indicative of a shift in understanding. Communities both knew that axes could be recycled and yet were choosing to deposit them whilst they were still usable. During this period, practices of breaking and damaging axes before deposition developed. This might involve breaking an axe into pieces or specifically damaging the butt, blade or margins. One way to interpret this practice is as a form of anticipatory action. It presumes something more is going to happen. Hoarding is also a form of anticipatory action. It suggests that Bronze Age communities thought that the axes they deposited continued to have future potential. Their life and usefulness was not over, just because they were buried in the ground. In some cases, this resulted in depositing tools ready for use, and in others, it resulted in practices aimed at reducing the future potential of axes by damaging them. Whilst ideas abound about hoarding practices, what I think can be agreed upon is that the axes that were being buried by communities had the potential to continue to work, whether that was in the hands of the gods in thanks to the earth or for future generations. One of the key innovations that comes with metalworking is the use of a mould. The use of moulds allows us to cast axes which are very similar to each other. This is a disruptive technology. Previous production methods for things like ceramics and lithics don't allow this kind of copying to happen. My argument suggests that in the early Bronze Age, metal's transformability was something that emerged gradually. And hoards offer us an interesting lens into this. 
It would be possible to produce an early Bronze Age hoard consisting of axes that were very similar in form, perhaps even axes cast from the same mould. As Andy Jones highlights, in Scotland and Northern Britain at this time, most axes consisted of most hoards, sorry, consisted of multiple axes. Yet what we see in hoarding practices during this period, in my analysis using metalwork wear analysis techniques, is that the axes that go into hoards have explicitly diverse forms and histories that were being brought together for deposition. Just as I can look down my microscope, look at the surface of an axe and begin to elucidate some of the history of an axe, past communities would have been able to observe the histories of specific axes effectively scratched on their surface. Some of the marks I look at are visible to the naked eye. And they would have known the histories of these objects through oral histories and stories. Metal in this time was increasingly understood as a transformable material. But at the same time, hoarding practices indicate that the histories of objects selected for deposition in hoards mattered. Those histories could be completely erased by recycling, but they weren't. Hoards were about the gathering together of axes with diverse histories, not axes with the same histories or axes that were exact copies of each other. The Hill of Finglenny Hoard from Scotland is an excellent example to illustrate uh, the argument that I've made here. It shows the tension between similarity of difference and the gathering of diverse histories in hoards. The hoard consists of seven tinned axes, four of which were deposited intact, intact and three were deposited broken. The axes were placed underneath a stone overlooking the wormy hill at Henge. Needham has argued that the hoard was probably gathered over several generations, and Moiler has argued that dissimilar wear across two of the breaks on DQ309 and DQ310 indicates the idea that they had different circulation histories prior to deposition. My own analysis adds to this story of different histories and complexity. Two of the axes in the hoard, the ones on the right hand side in the image, have a very strong asymmetry that we usually associate as in indicating heavy use. However, the story is perhaps a little more complex. Both axe blades have a very symmetrical side, uh, very asymmetrical wear on their left hand side as you can see them in the image, but their opposite blade corners, the right hand side as you see it in the image, are in very good conditioning suggesting that these were not axes that had been heavily used and then rehafted and reoriented in their haft to extend their lives and make them wear more evenly. evenly. I want to argue that these axes were being made deliberately asymmetrical for their deposition in the hoard, or perhaps leading to their deposition in the hoard. In addition to heavy use, there may have been some deliberate reshaping of these blades. DQ307 shows signs of heavy grinding over the top of wear marks. In contrast, DQ308 shows signs of wear across the blade that suggest it was rehafted during use to produce a more symmetrical blade. The three broken axes were intentionally fragmented. Matt Knight's work that was the subject of the Sarah Champion last year and of a soon to be published new volume by the Prehistoric Society shows that to achieve this kind of fragmentation, the axes were probably heated. DQ310 has a wide, deep incision on the blade fragment near the break, and DQ311 has an incision on the surface of the butt piece. In both cases, I want to suggest that these marks indicate failed attempts to fragment the axe. One side of the body of DQ313 shows signs of numerous small incisions to the surface, with a shape indicating these incisions were deliberately produced by a thinly bladed object. Interpreted as a whole, this is an assemblage of relatively similar looking axes tied together by their shared tinning, giving them a similar colour, but each of them has a very different history associated with it. And these different histories, I want to argue, were being explicitly gathered in hordes, playing on this concept of similarity and difference, the idea of simulacra, if you like, that comes with the use of the mould. Axes from metalwork assemblages four and five show similar signs of hammering, working, sharpening and resharpening as those from metalwork assemblage three. However, they're more likely to be decorated than earlier axes. This decoration is itself an interesting transformation. Decoration on these axes takes the form of incised designs on the surface and the use of hammering techniques decoratively. 
Both the method of design by incising and the patterns that were utilised have clear parallels with beaker and food vessel pottery. Just as pottery vessels were incised with complex designs, so too was metal. Stone axes were apparently not decorated. And I suggest it was the weight of pre-existing relations that meant this wasn't the case for axes before this point in time. Evidence for the use of these axes remains similar to those from the earlier metalwork assemblage three. And it also appears that hoards continue to be about the gathering of similar but different axes with clearly different histories. The probable axe hoard of Bally Valley type axes from Connor in County Antrim is a good example of this. The three axes each have very different histories. As is common in hoard deposits, one axe is more corroded than the others, making it a bit harder to interpret. However, the more corroded axe from the Greenwell collection, number 1542, is highly symmetrical with no damage to the butt. It was either very lightly used or perhaps even unused when it was deposited. By contrast, number 1544 from the Greenwell collection is a decorated axe with clear signs of use on the blade and what appears to be intentional damage. That's the axe that you can see in the middle of the screen now. There are two large, gently curved fractures to the blade that are unlikely to have formed through use. The final axe, the one on the right hand side on the screen, 1543 from the Greenwell collection, is a very unusual axe indeed. The entire blade of this axe has been carefully removed. What makes this removal even more impressive is that it's been done to complement the decorated surface of the axe. They've cut along a decoration line. These three axes had distinctly different histories written on their surfaces, despite having the same overall typological form. The removed blade of 1543 is not only indicative of a complex history, but also of the understanding of metal properties and processes that are developed by this point in time. The way in which this axe has had its blade removed to mirror its decoration is indicative of the expertise in manipulating this material, which was developing at this time. This axe is not just fragmented in two, but broken along a curve to remove the blade in concert with the decoration. In this lecture, I've sought to demonstrate how one type of axe, the early Bronze Age flat axe, changed constantly through its history. This isn't a radical and rapid transformation provoked by the arrival of metal. It's a series of gradual and local, locally situated changes where pre-existing ideas and processes surrounding axes greatly affected how metal axes would be understood and used. We see a transition from axes understood to have similar properties to stone axes through to axes which were locally appropriate and revealed an understanding of metal as a material that can be transformed through work and heat to metal as something which needed to be deposited in specific ways. Copper and bronze axes were excluded from graves and settlement sites, read together with the interpretation of hoarding as anticipatory action. I argue that axes were seen as an as active when they were away from humans. Metal came to be a powerful and vibrant material with future potential beyond the control of communities, causing its exclusion from settlement and burial sites. Two other emergent properties of metal, the potential to be transformed from solid to liquid to solid, and the ability to create copies, affected the development of hoarding practices as people played with ideas of similarity and difference. Through Metalwork Assemblage 3, 4 and 5, hoarding played on these concepts of similarity and difference as axes with different histories were brought together. Metal was not at this time a material that could be fully controlled or understood by humans. It was vibrant, capable of transformation and unpredictable. Thank you very much to lis for listening. Thanks to the Prehistoric Society and to the Champion family. If you want to contact me, because obviously I'm not here to answer questions in this format, then please feel free to drop me an email at your own convenience.